got a week in Vegas, $10,000 in my pocket, and I'm ready to play some poker. Our first stop for some No Limit Hold'em action is Resorts World. I've heard good things about it, and I know they're vlogger friendly, so we head over and immediately get seated at a 1-3 game. We buy in for the max of $300 and pick up the blinds back to back in our first two hands. That's when the dealer says, I don't think I've put a flop out in 13 years. My camera didn't catch it, but he goes on to say that he hasn't dealt a flop in the past 15 or so hands. Not a very good sign for a game. For that reason, we end up playing a few more uneventful hands before ultimately deciding to get up and leave. Given all the good things I'd heard about the Resorts World Poker Room, my short experience there was pretty underwhelming. Maybe we just didn't go on a good day, or maybe we went at the wrong time, but if you've played here, I'd love to hear in the comments what your experience was like. In any case, we book a small win of $24 and head out in search of a better game elsewhere. It's not too long before we find ourselves at the Bellagio. I've seen a ton of other vlogs from this venue and I'm super excited to check it out. It's clear as soon as we get here that this place is hopping. It doesn't take too long to get seated at a brand new 1-3 game and we buy in for the max of $300 again. This table is really friendly, there's a lot of fun social interaction going on, and I've got to say, it's one of the softest tables I've played at in a long time. There's a handful of players that admit that they've not played live before, or they've at least not played live in a casino, only at home games. Ten minutes in, we've got pocket threes under the gun. There's been a lot of limping, and I opt to limp in cheaply as well. There's one more limp behind, the small blind completes, and the big blind checks. We've got four players of the flop, which comes down 9-ace queen rainbow. The blinds check, and I make it $10. The other limper min raises to 20 and it folds back to us. We're definitely behind here, but it's such a weak raise that I feel like we might be able to steal this pot on the next street, so I make the call. The turn brings the 8 of clubs, I check, and as expected he bets out for $35. I put in the check raise, making it $95 total. He doesn't think too long to throw his cards in, and we take it down with what was likely the worst hand. A few hands later we've got 4-3 suited in the cutoff. The first player to act raises to $10 and it folds to us. I make the call with our small suited connectors, the button calls, and the big blind calls as well, so we've got 4 to the flop. It comes down 8 jack 5 with 2 diamonds, so we flop a flush draw. It checks to us and I opt to check behind since we've got 4 high and I'm expecting that we're not going to get everybody to fold. I'd rather take the free card. Unfortunately, the button's got other ideas as they make a pretty sizable bet relative to the size of the pot, making it $26. It folds back to us and I put in the chips to make the call. The turn brings us three of spades, so it's not the card we were hoping for, but we do pick up a pair, so we've got a little bit more equity now. I check again, and we see a much bigger bet this time for $60. We're definitely not getting the right outs to hit our flush, but if a three and a four are valid outs now for two pair of trips, then we've got another five outs that we didn't have before, giving a little less than three to one odds of hitting. We're not quite getting the right pot odds at about two and a half to one, but if we improve and get another bet on the river, then we've got the right implied odds, so I finally decide to call once more. The river brings the 4 of clubs, so we spike 2 pair on the river. Maybe I should be betting here since we've made our hand, granted it's not the one we were looking for. However, I felt a little safer going with a check, intending to call a bet. We get a quick check behind though, and I give our opponent the bad news. Our 2 pair is good, and we take it down. The very next hand we've got ace-king offsuit and we're sitting in the hijack. It falls to us, and I make it $11. The small blind deliberates before making the call, and we're heads up to the flop, which comes down 4-4-3 with two spades. It's a pretty good board for us to see bet, and probably take it down, so when our opponent checks, I put out a bet of $13. The small blind taps his chips a bit before finding a call, so we're off to the turn. The turn brings the six of clubs, which isn't the best card since if our opponent peeled with a draw of some sort, this card could be in their range. He checks to us again, and I check back, just hoping to get the showdown at this point. The river brings the jack of hearts, and the action goes check check. I show our ace high, our opponent flips up queen 7, and our hand is good. A half hour later, we're under the gun, and I straddle for $6. There's a raise to $15, and two other players call. We're closing the action, and we've got a pretty bad hand with 3 deuce offsuit, but it's only $9 to win 40 with the idea that it's an easy hand to get away from unless we flop big, so I put in the chips to call. I check dark, and the flop comes down queen ace 5 with 2 clubs. The preflop raiser C bets for 20, and the player on his left calls. We've got a gut shot, and our implied odds are huge if we hit, so I end up calling as well. And wouldn't you know it, the turn brings the four of diamonds. We spike our straight, picking up the absolute nuts. I check again, hoping the preflop raiser will continue with his line, and unfortunately he checks back. Thankfully, the last player doesn't let it check through though, betting out for $60. I think we've got two options here. 
We can call with our strong hand and hope the third player joins along, or we can spring the trap here, going for a check raise. Our hand feels strong enough that I'm not worried about too many rivers, so I decide just to go with a call here. The third player ends up folding though, so we're heads up to the river, which pairs the board with the five of diamonds. It's not the best river since some boats get there, but there are plenty of hands that don't improve that aren't willing to put out another bet on the river. I've seen this opponent overplay weak aces though, so I opt to check, hoping he'll continue to do so here. Unfortunately for us, he wisely checks back and shows that he's got top pair with ace seven. I announce our hand, and we scoop the pot. Ten minutes later, we've got pocket fives in the hijack. It folds around to us, and I raise it up to $10. The cutoff, button, and small blind all call, so we've got four players to the flop. It comes down 488. The small blind checks, and I see bet for half pot $20, since our hand is probably good as long as no one hit the eight. The cutoff quickly folds, and the button thinks for a few seconds before making the call. The small blind folds, so we're heads up now. The turn brings the seven of hearts. It's another overcard door pair, but we do pick up a gut shot in case we were behind on the flop. I don't want to bloat the pot though, so I check and our opponent checks back. The river brings the three of spades, and I check once more, hoping to get to showdown. Our opponent bets out for $30, and I think we've got a call here since he could be doing this with a four that he paired with on the flop just as well as a seven or eight, so I put the chips in. Alright, I'll pay you up. Good. Okay. Unfortunately, he shows nine eight suited for flop trips, and our fives are no good. About 20 minutes later, we're sitting in the cutoff, shorthanded, there's six players, and we've got King Deuce suited. It folds to us, and I raise to $10. The button three bets to 30, and the big blind cold calls. I'd definitely fold if it was heads up, but given the overcall, it's only costing us $20 to win 70, and this game is playing pretty transparently after the flop, so I decide to join along since we're getting a pretty good price. The flop comes down 836 rainbow. The big blind and I check to the preflop raiser, who checks back. When he checks back, I'm pretty confident that he's got big cards that didn't connect based upon how he's been playing and comments he's made throughout the night about his big pairs constantly losing and his big unpaired cards constantly missing. When the turn brings the nine of clubs, giving us the backdoor flush draw and the big blind checks a second time, this feels like a pretty good spot for us to make a bet. Not only have both players shown weakness, but we've got a flush draw to give us some equity in case we do get called. I make it $35 and it only takes a few seconds for the button to throw his hand away with the big blind immediately folding behind. We take it down with king high. The next orbit, we're in the plus one position and we've got 8-4 suited in diamonds. I've been playing a bit looser as I've warmed up to the table and have a pretty good read on how everyone's playing, especially post-flop where I've been able to steal a lot of pots at this point since it's been pretty clear when my opponents have been afraid of certain scare cards throughout each hand. Given my comfort, I raise a hand I'd normally fold here making it $11. Just the cutoff call so we're heads up. And we get a pretty good flop when it comes down 310 deuce with two diamonds, giving us a flush draw along with some back doors. I lead for $15 and our opponent doesn't take too long to call. Unfortunately, the turn doesn't help us when it brings the seven of hearts. I continue the story though as the aggressor, making it $25. This particular opponent makes a play I've seen him make a few times before where he min raises to $50. I don't think he'd do this without at least a pair, meaning that we're drawing specifically to a flush. And with it only being $25 for us to call, we're getting 4 to 1 odds on a call, which is definitely giving us the right odds to call to hit our hand. I make the call, and while the dealer's collecting the chips, I think that this is a great spot to... Check dark. With the idea that I don't want our opponent to know what we would have done regardless of whether we make our hand or not. And we get a pretty great river in the form of the 9 of diamonds giving us our flush. And things get even better when our opponent grabs a $100 chip and tosses it across the betting line. We're definitely raising here, but the question is how much to raise, and how long to hesitate before putting the bet out. Our opponent's pretty deep at this point, and he's shown respect a few times to the extent that I don't think pushing all in is appropriate. Instead, I decide to make it about two and a half times his bet, making it $260 in all. It sounds like he was trying to bluff us, as he says, Put me on your line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though, maybe it wasn't a complete bluff, as he goes on to contemplate for another minute or so. Eventually, he relents and throws his hand away, and we take down another one. It's been a friendly game, so I show my hand to make him feel better about his laydown. We win a few small pots over the next hour, but nothing very interesting until we pick up two black tens in the cutoff. There's one early position limp from a player who's limped raised a few times early in the session, and it's been a bit of a running joke at the table since then. Everyone else folds to us, and I raise it up to $16. It folds back to the limper, and I joke with him, saying, You hadn't, you hadn't limp raised in a while, so I thought it might be safe, finally. <laughs> well, for you, 
<laughs> oh, all right, all right. Doubling my bet? Yep. All right. I know you're not gonna fold. He doubles the bet and I make the call, so we're heads up to the flop. It's a pretty good one for our hand as it comes down eight high. Our opponent checks to us, so I tell him. Do the same bet. He shuffles his cards for a moment before throwing his hand away, and we win a bigger pot than we probably would have without unintentionally goading him into limp raising us pre flop. About 15 minutes later, we've got king six suited and diamonds in the cutoff. There's a $6 straddle, it folds to us, and I raise it up to $16 in position. The big blind and straddle both call, so we've got three players to the flop. It comes down queen jack five rainbow, so we miss the board, but it's a pretty good one for us to see bet since it definitely hits our range. So when it checks to us, I make it $25. Just the big blind calls, and when he does, I'm pretty sure he's probably got at least second pair given how he's been playing. The straddle gets out of the way, so we're heads up to the turn. The turn brings the five of diamonds pairing the board. We pick up a flush draw now, and when our opponent checks again, I'm inclined to take the free card since I don't expect to get a bet through here. You're scaring me. I don't think I've ever seen you call a bet on the flop. <laughs> the river brings the miracle four of diamonds, giving us the backdoor flush. I was going to go for the chip raise because she said to. <laughs> That's, no. And I was rightfully scared. Now I got to lead out. <laughs> he makes it $40, and I come back with. Well, now I feel like I should bluff raise. <laughs> Like this is, my, this is my this is my chance, there. right? There's yeah. Like the, the five like a five is in my range. <laughs> I, should, like, I could have queens full and I'd be like, yeah. oh, like he's got quads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be the case. I'll make it a hundred. Oh. I'm gonna see if you can get away from a boat, top boat. <laughs> Eventually he does make the fold. Good fold. Good fold. Do you wanna see? I got I got lucky, I backdoored the flush. <laughs> Another 15 minutes pass before we pick up ace-king offsuit in the hijack. The player on our right raises to $10, and we've got a premium, so we're definitely 3-betting here. I make it $35, and the button, who was our opponent in the last hand, cold calls with position on us. It folds back to the original raiser, who joins along, so we've got 3 to the flop. And we get a pretty good flop when it comes down ace-high with 2 spades, giving us top pair top kicker with the backdoor nut flush draw. The original Razor is first to act, and he pushes all in for $62 total. We're definitely staying in the hand here, but the question is whether we raise or call. I'm inclined to call since the player behind us could have a big ace that's second best to ours and would only be drawing to three outs. I don't want to scare him out of the hand if that's the case. The button ends up folding though, so we get to see the board run out with the seven of clubs on the turn and the deuce of hearts on the river. The all-in player shows 10-8 suited in spades for a flush draw on the flop that couldn't get there and we take it down. Just two hands later, well, we've got a mystery hand. I've been straddling every time I've been under the gun, but unfortunately, I missed putting the chips out before the cards were dealt this time. Oh, I missed my straddle, dang it. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blind raise. I'm not, blind, blind raise, I didn't look. <laughs> so with our blind raise, we get three calls and the four of us head to the flop. Now, now here's the question, do I look at my hand or do I just bet at any flop? The flop comes down king four seven with two diamonds. And I stay true to my word and lead out for half pot, $12. It falls to the limp raise player from earlier who I joke around with again here. Not too big, not too small. It's just right. Just right for a min raise. He puts out a min raise, making it $24. All right, I gotta look now. We look down and see king queen offsuit, a surprisingly strong hand given the circumstances. No. Oh, all right, well. Okay, well, I, 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 think, I, might, I, I think I might three bet and make it interesting. Let's see, you made it 25. There's 24? Let's see, what should I do? All right, I'll make it 64. Really? So you must have flopped a set then. Limped pot. You didn't want to raise even though you knew I didn't straddle and I just blind raised. You've got what? You've got like 300 bucks there? I can't call. I've got a legitimately good hand though. I fold and show my hand and he shows pocket sevens for middle set. Yeah, I thought you might have a set. Good hand. So we make a good lay down and avoid setting our chips on fire. 
The very next hand, we've got Ace Deuce suited in the big blind. The end of the gun player straddles to six, and it folds to the small blind who calls. I call with our ace, and the straddle ends up raising his option, making it $20. The small blind calls, and we've underrepresented our hand, and it's only $14 more for us to win 46 so we've got a pretty straightforward call that we make here. We've just got to be a bit wary if we hit an ace, since we could easily be dominated. And of course, the flop comes down ace 4 3 rainbow, putting us in exactly that predicament. We both check to the straddle, who see best for half pot, making it $30. The small blind folds, and we've got top pair along with a gut shot, so we definitely can't fold at this point. I put in the chips to call. And the turn's a pretty good one, as it comes down the five of clubs, hitting our gut shot and giving us the wheel. I check to our opponent again, and he quickly checks back. The river brings the queen of spades, and given the action, I think we could definitely get paid off here by any big ace our opponent might be holding. I lead up for $100, and he doesn't think for too long before throwing in a chip to call. I announce our hand, and unsurprisingly, it's good. Almost an hour later, this really interesting hand comes up with a situation I haven't run into before. One of the gun with ace four suited. I play this hand a little atypically, limping in, which I've only tried to do one or two other times all night. The player behind us limps in as well, and the hijack raises it up to $15. It falls back to the big blind who calls, so I call as well expecting the other limper to join along, which he does. We've got four players with the flop. It comes down jack five deuce rainbow, so we flop a gut shot and it checks to the player who limped in behind us who now decides to make a pretty weak lead for about one quarter pot, $15. The preflop razor folds and the small blind calls. I decide to peel once thinking that we've got an overcard and a gut shot and given the weak bet we might be able to make a play for the pot if a scare card comes. The turn doesn't improve our hand as it brings down the queen of clubs, but I would call it a scare card if our opponent was betting with top or second pair on the flop. The small blind checks, and I decide that this might be worth betting at to see if we can steal the pot at this point. This is where it gets interesting. As I'm reaching for my chips and counting out a stack to bet with, you can see the dealer turns over the river, the deuce of hearts, even though I haven't acted. I didn't notice that she had done this since I'm focused on counting out my bet for the turn still, and I put out a bet of forty dollars. Wait, what? What happened? The turn, the turn didn't check around. No, I didn't do it. I was betting. No, I was betting on the turn. There was no check. I, I didn't act. Well, here's the, I'm, I, I wasn't betting anyway. I have a pair of eights. I know they're no good. So I would talk. Uh, should we call the floor? Just to, I don't know what's supposed to happen. If you want, you can, like, so we'll get the floor anyway, but if you want, you can take it back. I've, I've gone to it. The player on my left goes on to say that he motioned a check without realizing that I hadn't checked, and that's what the dealer saw, thinking that we checked around. The floor ends up coming over, and we explain the situation, and it gets even more awkward at this point as the player on my left says that the deuce on the river helped him. I feel bad since now I know what he was betting with, which isn't information I was intending to draw out of him, and the floor ultimately rules with... Does that get shuffled back in? Yes. Yeah. Well, I was going to fold now, but the boost really helped me. Yeah, I'm going to fold. I apologize to him for any confusion caused on my end and offer back whatever he's put into the pot at this point, but he doesn't take me up on the offer. I felt kind of bad about how this played out, but I think I felt even more bad knowing that the deuce would have ultimately helped my opponent had the turn action checked through, and hearing him say so confirmed that my bluff on the turn was the right play. On the other hand, I feel like I was in the right to protect my action on the turn, regardless of whether I was bluffing or had a legitimate hand. I'm curious what you guys think about how this played out. Was I in the right to call the floor over the action that transpired, or should I have just treated my bet as the river action, which was never my intention? Let me know in the comments below what you would have done in my shoes. Three hands later, we've got Queen Jack offsuit in the button. The under the gun player straddles for $6, and it folds around to us. I make it 16 and it folds to the straddle, who's pretty inebriated at this point, and three bets to $46. We've got position and a pretty good hand versus his range, even with him three betting, so I make the call. The flop comes down jack four king with two spades, so we've got second pair with a good kicker. He surprisingly checks, which I wasn't expecting, and I'm happy to check back since I don't want to bloat the pot with just second pair. The turn's an interesting one as we see the queen of clubs come down, giving us two pair. He checks the second time, and given his passive post-flop line, I feel like we can bet for value now. 
I make it $40 and he immediately check raises all in for $201 total. Really? Your king queen? Or you flop a set? You flopped a set of kings, didn't you? I think for a long time that we're beat that he's got to have a set or a top two pair or something along those lines. But as I think about it more, I don't think top two makes sense here as I expect he would have bet out on the flopper turn to protect against an ace. And I don't think a set would have checked a second time either. I recall this player overplayed a weak ace earlier with just top pair in a multi-way pot and ultimately I decide that he's probably more likely to have a hand like ace king at best. Finally, I decide. All right. Your head, your head. Excellent. Is it? <laughs> Maybe. But you got the 10 though. <laughs> you don't want to show me. Oh, no. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> I almost folded. It almost, you almost had it. That was close. He flips over pocket deuces, meaning we made the right call and our hand is way good. Four hands later, we've got queen deuce suited in the plus one position. The first player limps in, and a fair number of limps have been getting through, so I decide to limp behind. The cutoff raises it to 20, the button calls the raise, and the big blind calls as well. We're closing the action, so screw it. I put in the chips to call. The flop comes down 9-5 king with two hearts, so we flop a flush draw. The player on the right makes a weak lead for $15. I call, and both the other players call as well. The turn brings the eight of clubs. We don't improve, and the same player makes another weak lead for $15. I briefly consider raising given the fact that everyone was so passive on the flop and we could possibly take it down here. However, I ultimately decide that we're probably not going to get raised if we call in this turn since it doesn't change too much and we're getting a good price, so I just go with a call once again. The player behind us calls, and the last player pushes all in for $97 total. The original better folds, and it's back on us. We've got a call $82 to win 283, so we're getting about three and a half to one odds on a call. We're technically not getting the right odds to hit our flush, so it's actually a bad call assuming we're behind, but it ultimately doesn't stop me from putting the chips in. The player behind us folds, so we're heads up to the river. You're ahead. And like within two hours, I got a draw. You're out not? I can't win the bet. I'm on the way to the diner. Send Marsha no me. No bear. And pick up the you money. Hit the seven? So oh my God. <laughs> he flips up 10-7 of hearts, meaning we were going for the same flush draw and we were ahead on the turn, but he rivered a pair to take it down. 10 minutes later, we've got the last interesting hand of the night. We've got Queen-10 suited in the hijack. The under the gun player straddles the 6 and it folds to us. I raise to $20 and both the small blind and the straddle call, so we've got 3 players to the flop. It comes down ace queen 10 with two diamonds, so we flop bottom two pair, though we get a bit of a scary action flop here. The straddle checks to us, and I see bet a bit on the bigger side given the coordination of the board, making it $40. The small blind folds, and the straddle now check raises, making it 100 even. I ask how much he's playing for, and he's got another $350 or so behind. We're really only worried about ace queen, ace 10, and king jack here. The way this guy's been playing, I expect he would have 3-bet ace-queen, and I feel like he probably would have waited till a future street to check-raise with a hand as solid as king-jack. His bet doesn't exude too much strength either, as I think if he was worried about any of the draws out there, he would have made the bet much bigger. There's a lot of pair plus draw hands that he could be making this move with as well, and ultimately I think we've got the best hand versus a lot of hands he could be doing this with. Perhaps my thinking's flawed, but I just feel like we've got to protect our hand versus those draws, and I decide to throw out a chip and declare... All in. He doesn't immediately call, and the longer he thinks, the more I think we've got the best hand. After about 30 seconds or so, he throws his hand away saying he had a flush draw, which I definitely believe. All right, y'all. Uh, so I totally, I'm so exhausted, it's very late. Uh, for me, it's like uh, almost two o'clock here, three o'clock in my normal time zone, and uh, I, I'm, I turned 40 last month, I'm old as hell, so <laughs> my bedtime is much earlier uh, with a kid and all. Uh, anyway, I, I'm so tired, I forgot to record my uh, results while I was at the casino, so I'm doing it here in the hotel room. Um, so pretty great session, one that I definitely needed. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned on uh, various different forms of social media and in comments and things like that. Um, that after hitting my 25k bankroll challenge that I've had a uh, pretty big downswing like in all uh, you know I lost about 5,000 after that um, like 
I won't get into it, but a lot of, like, yes, bad play, for sure. I'm not denying that. Um, but there were, like, so many terrible, like, felt like bad variant spots, like, bad... I, I, people hate to hear about bad beats, but, like, just felt like bad beat after bad beat, like, people hitting gut shots against sets, like, sh shit like that. Um, but anyway, like, end result, down 5,000, feeling, f been feeling uh, a bit de demoralized on the um, playing of poker and the publishing of the vlog, but... Uh, so very happy to, with the win from tonight. Um, one, of, one, so bought into the one-three game at Bellagio for three hundred, cashed out for a little over thirteen hundred for a win of a little over a thousand in the span of five hours. So uh, two hundred dollars an hour, and I, I gotta say, after playing in Texas for so long, uh, it's a it's quite a reminder, like how much you actually pay for rake. You know, if I, if I had won the same hands in Texas and then paid my hourly rate of um, ten dollars an hour I feel like I would have won quite a bit more probably a couple hundred dollars more in all with how much uh, came out of the rake pretty much any significant pot that was you know, like a pot that's fifty dollars or more five dollars comes out automatically and that adds up fast so um, pretty pretty interesting to see that the uh, you know if it feels like you're paying a lot when you're in the Texas poker rooms paying the hourly rate but in all like you're as long as you're not just card dead the whole time, uh, it averages out. You're, you're paying less at the card rooms in Texas than you are to the casino rake uh, in, in Vegas or elsewhere. So um, anyway, uh, kind of going on a tangent, but great result for today for the cash game. Um, I'm not sure what tomorrow's going to bring yet, but uh, stay tuned for the next episode and we'll see. Thanks a lot for watching. Hit the like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next one. Take care, y'all.